So now we come to a particularly interesting discussion about the future of tech policies in 2021 and beyond. And to help us navigate these challenging waters, uh, we have Sarah Fisher of Axios. Sarah is a media reporter and is the author of the must read Axios Media Trends Weekly Newsletter and covers breaking news and analysis about the industry. Her coverage spans corporate media, technology, social media, regulation, policy, and consumer habits. So I can't think of a better person to hand over to moderate our next session. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We know it's been such a fantastic day of great conversations, and we're so grateful that you're joining us for our final discussion. We wanted to wrap today by talking about what's ahead in terms of how we should be thinking about policy in regards to children's safety, especially online. And so with that, I wanted to just remind you, if you have any interest in asking a question, you can tweet us using the hashtag FOSI2020, and those questions will come at us in a queue or you can submit questions uh, directly to the folks running the conference. And then I also wanted to just thank the folks at FOSSI for hosting us today. I'm going to kick it off and let our panelists introduce themselves briefly before we get to questions. So we'll start with Richard Downing. Richard? Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Richard Downing. I work with the Department of Justice uh, here in Washington. I'm very pleased to be able to be with you today um, and to share some views. Uh, by way of background, uh, I've been a prosecutor for 28 years now, uh, 20 of which have been at the Department of Justice focused on computer crime and online issues. For the past five years or so, I have had the opportunity to uh, oversee our child exploitation and obscenity section. So uh, they're the DOJ leaders for prosecuting crimes against children. Uh, and of course, now I also work on issues related to privacy and security and justice for child victims. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Alexandra Givens from CDT. Hi, I'm Alexandra Givens. I'm the CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. We're a 25-year-old civil society organization that focuses on protecting users, individual rights, and democratic values in the digital age. Uh, what does that mean in real in the real language? Um, we talk, we work on privacy issues, we think about algorithmic fairness, we think about security and surveillance. We think about free expression online. We think about student privacy. We're thrilled to join you today. Thank you so much. And Dr. Nicole Turner Lee from the Brookings Institution. Well, hello there. I'm Nicole Turner Lee, a Senior Fellow in Governance Studies and the Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution, which is a global think tank focused on a variety of issues from foreign policy to economic studies to just how Congress works. And I'm thrilled to be here because as I prepare to release next year my new book on the U.S. digital divide, which focuses on digital disparities, particularly among groups that now are really being considered underclass due to a lack of access, we really have to really take this um, by the hair and just figure out what we have to do to close these disparities. Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for introducing themselves. I want to jump right in and I'm going to start with Alex here. We had some news yesterday. The CEOs of some of the biggest technology companies in the U.S. appeared before the Senate yesterday to talk a lot about content moderation, free expression. Um, and I wanted to know, in terms of how this impacts children, how does any sort of reform around content moderation, potentially with Section 230, impact the type of content that's going to be reaching our nation's kids? Sure. So these content moderation questions have been top of mind and making headline news, in particular in the run-up to the election, um, where you saw a lot of companies um, feeling pressure, but then responding to that pressure to take new approaches to content moderation. At CDT, one of the things that we focus on is how do we make sure that companies are thinking responsibly and accountably uh, for the type of content moderation that they do. And one of the things that I think there's been real progress in is thinking about the variety of tools in the toolkit. A couple of years ago, we would always talk about take up or take down, this kind of binary decision around content. And what we've seen in the past few months is a lot more sophistication around labeling, around fact checking, around providing click through windows, around thinking through what content gets surfaced in an algorithm and what doesn't. 
And that's a really important uh, development, in my opinion, that we need to keep watching in the future as they continue uh, to look at those uses. As for Oh, please go ahead. No, I was just going to follow up with you in terms of 230. I mean, some people say that those new innovations like labels and stuff, that they're not going far enough. So I'd be curious your thoughts on 230 and your response to those critics that these sort of middle of the ground solutions still don't do it. Yeah, so one of my hopes for the upcoming Congress is that we can move past some of the politicization of 230. What we've seen the past year in particular is a lot of pressure saying some saying platforms aren't doing enough others actually trying to undermine the very tools that the platforms use. So we saw President Trump's executive order, there's actually legislation scheduled for markup in the Judiciary Committee tomorrow that would inhibit and take away some of the platform's ability to moderate by making them accountable if they respond to particular types of speech. So my hope is that in the new Congress, we can set some of that aside and instead be having a much more rational conversation around what responsible content practices look like. To me, I think the jury is still out as to whether legislation gets us there or not. I will say that I'm very worried about some of the run on effects of some of the legislation that can be discussed. And the reason is, first of all, and most importantly, there is only so much that Congress can do in the United States when we have the First Amendment. And unfortunately, um, you know, there exists awful speech in the world, but it remains lawful. And so Congress actually can't come out and prohibit that. So that means that instead we need to be thinking much more around how do we incentivize those platforms to act, what should we be asking them to do, and how do we make sure that there's due process and transparency so we can have a more informed conversation around some of these tools. Thank you, that's so helpful. And I wanna kick it to Richard. So there's a lot of conversations happening right now to Alex's point around incentivizing these platforms. One of the things that the DOJ is involved in is maybe looking at whether or not they're so big that they don't have much incentive to follow up with some of these new reforms. I want to get your take on that. So uh, as you may know, uh, in particular on the 230 front, uh, the Department of Justice ran a process to think about that question and whether there should be some sort of reaction or change to Section 230. Um, and I'm not uh, in a position to talk about the political speech side of things. I want to focus, if I can, on the, the child protection side of it. Um, in particular, the laws that were passed in the 19, uh, Section 230, which was passed in the 1990s, uh, was intended to protect good Samaritans and good uh, uh, moderation practices. But unfortunately, it's been interpreted so broadly by the courts that you, if, the liter if you're literally a bad Samaritan, someone who's promoting criminal conduct, you still get to claim that immunity. And we think that should change. The other area where we see a, a need for change is where there is really serious criminal conduct on platforms. Uh, there needs to be a chance for victims to have redress in the courts. So in 2018, for example, Congress passed an exception to 230 called FOSTA, which allows victims of human trafficking to sue uh, in order to get redress for injustices against them. We think that the same kind of carve out should be applied to child sexual exploitation victims and cyber stalking victims. These are serious situations that need to be addressed. So we very much welcome this debate and this question. Um, if you are interested in more on these issues, uh, we have published a uh, white paper in June of this year and later draft legislation to sort of lay out what we see as a, a moderate uh, middle of the road kind of position to address these issues while making sure that we are at the same time protecting freedom of speech. Richard, I have a quick follow-up for you, which is that if you are somebody that wants to seek a carve-out or some sort of an exception to one of these rules, and you are a child victim, who's in most of these cases representing the kids? Is it their parents? Is it groups? Do you oftentimes have kids representing themselves? How does that work? Well, right now, there's not a lot of um, ability to bring suit against uh, offenders uh, because of uh, or it's certainly against the, the, the platforms as a result of the, the 230 immunity. So we haven't seen much of that. However, uh, children who are harmed um, and their parents have the ability to um, hire lawyers and to bring suits where there's an appropriate remedy uh, to be had. For our part, we're going to prosecute the crimes, the criminal activity. We're going to continue doing that. But there ought to be, I think, a broader set of remedies available to victims. Super helpful, thank you so much. I wanna pivot to Nicole. One of the reasons I know that Stephen and the folks at Fossey wanted to have this particular conversation is because we've had so much change in children's online habits due to the pandemic. And it's not just virtual learning, but it's virtual extracurriculars. Nicole, what are you seeing 
in terms of children's habits changing as we've moved to a more virtual life during the pandemic? Well, thank you for that question. And if you don't mind, I just want to chime in on this the last conversation on Section 230, because I think it's worth uh, sharing among this group. I do think, however we land up going in terms of the route of where Section 230 lands up, I do want to echo my colleagues that we have to actually be very careful, because what could be seen as um, speech that may not be preferable to one side, one political party, uh, may jeopardize other speeches where we don't have a, a diversity of voices that exist across communications platforms. And so for young people, that particularly matters uh, after coming off of four years of a very repressive regime uh, that literally tried to dissuade and diminish the experiences of people of color. So as we go forward, I know that there are some civil rights groups that have been looking at exceptions when it comes to civil rights speech and making sure, uh, one, due to the lack of diversity that it often exists on content moderation teams, as well as the increased perception of liability by content companies, that they don't squash those voices in the meantime because that could also, I think, limit some of the liberation um, speech that we want to see exhibited among young people who will become the next wave of activists and others who are gonna change society for the better. Uh, with that being said, I think we have seen more kids actually become much more uh, astute to what's actually happening in the world as a result of their technology dependence. I mean, it's no secret that when we experienced the beginning of the pandemic, that 50 million public school students were sent home, 15 to 16 million of them didn't have broadband there were a whole but there were a whole lot of kids that did including my 14 year old daughter and as a result of that many much of their behavior is not only being socialized by what they experience online but how they're learning is actually experienced online and so so on the one hand, this is one of those spaces where kids are learning new ways of engaging with teachers. Um, I just talked on a panel this morning about this reimagination of education because we may not see the physical doors of schools actually open. Um, in some cases, that is actually putting stresses on mental health for young people. I had a 14-year-old breakdown in my arms after realizing that she could not see her friends. But there's something that I think that could be interesting as a silver lining moment as we actually look at this as well, Sarah, and that is these young people are also learning some of the skills that are going to be required for the future of work, uh, working in remote environments, being connected in disaggregated ways, uh, dealing with you know concentrate un, dis, you know non concentrated groups is actually the way we're, we're talking now. It's the way that we actually work, and I, I'm assured that that's actually going to be the route that we're going to take coming out of this pandemic when we realize that the hundred thousand plus bills, businesses that have closed are not coming back. And so yes, I think that there's some lessons that we're learning, but I also think as the spot is always paid attention to. We need to be sensitive to the experiences of kids in general, but particularly underrepresented kids who are oftentimes, you know, at home by themselves because their parents are frontline workers or are trying to navigate through virtual learning without the adequate supplies, including a device or home broadband access. And so those have consequences in the long run that I think we need to pay attention to going forward. I think that broadband inequity is huge. I want to bring it to Alex to ask her about that. What are you seeing in terms of broadband inequity and how it impacts children? Yeah, without question. I would like to at one point turn back to um, some of the content moderation pieces, but on the digital divide, continuing that piece, Nicole's exactly right. Think about those numbers for a minute, right? 15 to 16 million kids that can't access education because of lack of connectivity. We see these pictures of kids doing homework in a parking lot, right, of a restaurant, just trying to take advantage of the free Wi-Fi. Um, and that's deeply problematic when we think about entrenching existing inequality and setting kids back. One of the things that we've been focused on at CDT is also on the experience of students and teachers as we think about student privacy, right? Suddenly every experience between a teacher and a student is being mediated by new technologies. And we have teachers, superintendents suddenly acting as chief information officers. So what is that for them to get up to speed so fast, so quickly at a time when they're also pivoting their teaching strategies, thinking about emotional support for kids, but also thinking about what their digital needs are. Um, and so we've been very focused on getting those resources into the hands of educators, into the hands of families. Picking up on a point that Nicole made about the generational change, CDT recently did a study um, of over a thousand families and a thousand educators going out and asking them what they think about this transition to digital learning, whether they feel supported. And actually some of the findings were really interesting. Three in four said that they actually saw the move to technology as a positive and they thought it would continue after the pandemic. 
So I think, Nicole, you're absolutely right that there is a seismic shift here, thinking about how kids engage in the world and in particular how they engage in learning. But what we need to do, if that's going to be the world and, and kids on families do see a positive, we need to make sure they're getting the supports that they need. So we need better resources, we need better protections in place for privacy, for data security, and making sure that we're upping that digital literacy so that students and families feel protected. Right. And I, and I don't know if I could just jump in real quickly on that, too, as well, Sarah. I think, you know, Alex is completely right. We have to put in the right infrastructure uh, and assets that kids can actually navigate through this new digital space, as well as educators, because there are some educators sitting in the parking lots of Taco Bells and schools and libraries actually teaching their curricula. But what's also something that's really interesting is we're losing kids in this process, right? Because this in, imbalance when it comes to having digital access is creating kids to just not want to log on or be become laggards because they feel that it's just not worth it. Um, there's this new concept of digital uh, tr virtual truancy that is very problematic, particularly when you apply that to groups of students of color that have already historically gone through the ringer when it comes to the type of scrutiny uh, for just being Black, Hispanic, or Asian. And so I think going forward, it's really important for us to have like a new social contract. Um, I've been talking about this whole thing of no child left offline that I think speaks to the type of equalities that we need that do not play us in a space where we're replicating the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, where kids don't have the, the tools that they need to be successful. And we're also being sensitive to the fact that these widening achievement gaps are actually going to transfer into widening opportunity gaps. And if you look at where this COVID generation is today, and you place them 10 years from now into those industries where retention of information actually matters, like in math and science, go figure, you know, we're really in trouble. And I, I definitely agree that we're really doing a disservice by not figuring out together, all hands on deck, how we balance connectivity needs with privacy needs, as well as the future of industry, so that we find ourselves in a better place after this pandemic. Nicole, I want to follow up on this balance of needs. We had a poll question out to some of the folks in the audience, and we said, what should be the top priority for policymakers in 2021? And the number one thing, actually, I'm going to throw this question to Richard, was federal privacy legislation. That got 41% of the votes uh, ahead of improving broadband access and amending Section 230. Richard, what should we be doing to address child privacy online? So uh, the, uh, the privacy legislation question is, is a big one. I do think having uh, the current situation with California off uh, passing privacy legislation um, of its own um, and having that be a default doesn't seem like quite the right answer. Um, but uh, how to replace it and what's the best process for doing that is, is of course, a, a very difficult one. We're also facing this uh, question of privacy online vis-a-vis -vis what the Europeans are doing. So we have these issues around the uh, GDPR um, and these other questions of how the Europeans are looking at privacy. And so it's very much a front and center question for the work that I do to um, ask how we can um, make improvements, how we can improve the situation, while also making sure that it's a sensible regime that works with our trading partners in the case of Europe and with uh, the state laws that are uh, increasingly um, uh, coming up. I want to follow up on that, Richard. So we copied GDPR, essentially. We started making adjustments to our privacy laws when Europe passed GDPR on May 25th, two years ago. I want to ask you, do you think that we're going to be looking at GDPRK, their sort of children's privacy model, as a model for something that could work here? So I think uh, we need to be taking into account and thinking about what other countries are doing. Absolutely. I wouldn't say, though, that the privacy laws that we, that have the California ones are the ones that are in consideration in Congress are, are just a retread of GDPR. I think thinking about ways to be pragmatic about industry's needs, about government and regulatory needs, but front and center, privacy and the security of people's communications, having a more pragmatic approach to all those things may be better uh, than uh, simply shutting things down in a in a more aggressive way. So solving that problem is not one that I, I can certainly say we have a, a silver bullet for, but one that certainly for the Department of Justice, we will be engaged in looking at. Alex, a lot of parents are curious to Richard's point about what we're gonna do about privacy in terms of kids. In the latest FOSSI study on some of the tools for today's digital parents, you have 63% of parents for kids ages seven to 11 that think tools to block adult content from kids is critical, but not every parent thinks that they're doing enough. So what should we be telling parents in terms of how progress is being made in Washington? Is there progress being made? 
Well, your poll answers warm my heart. That's exactly how I feel. Passing baseline privacy legislation needs to be an absolute priority in the new Congress. Think about it this way. There is data being used, collected, and shared about us that is overwhelmingly unregulated. And typically, the regimes rely right now on companies disclosing their privacy practices with the theory that we then opt in and we have a choice whether or not to use that service. That idea of putting the burden on the user to read those terms of services and decide whether or not a platform's policies are up to snuff for them is completely unrealistic when you think about the experience of the modern user and the modern parent. So instead, we need to be thinking about baseline limitations on collection, on use, on sharing, and having much clearer uh, rules of the road. That will give companies more certainty, but really importantly, it's going to give users and families more certainty about what data is being collected and what happens to it after the fact. That's what I'm excited about in the legislative push. And I will say, you know, is there hope? There was a lot of progress made this year at a time when Congress was being dysfunctional and yelling at each other over almost everything else under the sun. There has been some good coming together of agreement on some critical pieces of federal privacy legislation. Now, there are still some big gaps to close, um, and in particular, thinking through some of the discrimination questions that Nicole was raising a little bit earlier. Um, there are a couple of pieces of those puzzle that we really need, need, need do need to work through. Um, but I think this is the time for us to push, push really hard to try and get it done. I wanna go back to some of those discrimination questions. Uh, Nicole, Alex was saying that some of the unintended consequences of writing these laws, obviously, is that when you have a broad-based policy, you might have some people that are left behind or that are uh, inadvertently impacted by it. Uh, what do you make of that? Do you think if we were to pass some sort of national privacy legislation, there could be some negative consequences, maybe small and medium-sized businesses that get left behind? Yeah, you know, I, I think those are all great questions. And I'm actually very excited about the promise that um, the Biden presidency brings because of the fact that they've centered their campaign as well as their promises around racial equity. I mean, when we think about privacy, we haven't for a really long time thought about where do we actually place civil rights laws and statutes into privacy discussions. And what we have found is as we have been sort of sitting on our hands waiting for privacy legislation to happen, we've seen this introduction of machine learning algorithms that are, you know, with great sophistication coming in and doing doing that, that dirty work anyway. And so I said, we think about what that looks like going forward. It's really important for us. And we've written that about this at Brookings, my colleague, Cam Carey, Caitlin Chin, as well as John Morris, is that there absolutely has to be some level of attention to um, compliance with civil rights laws when you're collecting information. I mean, think about COVID-19. Think about young people who are the children of COVID-19. We can tell you with precision how many African-American kids and Hispanic kids actually get infected because of their parents. Eight Hispanic kids are eight times more likely to get COVID because they live in a household with a family that is uh, highly likely to have COVID. African-Americans have COVID now as the third highest disease on behind pulmonary disease as well as respiratory diseases. With that being the case, could you imagine without privacy legislation, the type of manipulation and deception and exploitation that may happen? So we ultimately going forward need to have Congress begin to settle upon these laws. And I think we saw some glaring agreement uh, from both sides of the aisle on this in uh, recent drafts of legislation. And hopefully we'll get closer on that particularly as we begin to look at, I know CDT is interested in this, algorithmic bias and what that looks like. Because obviously, wherever you start in the collection of data and wherever you start in that ability of that data to be repurposed for other uses, is going to have an unintended consequences on groups that have been legally protected, um, especially young people. And so that's something really we've been focusing on. And obviously to the question about compliance, it has to be fair. I mean, the challenge that we have going forward out of this pandemic is the brick and mortar store no longer exists. So there has to be some alleviation of the type of stress that small businesses will have trying to comply with everything that now wraps around the digital ecosystem. So the extent to which we can show, you know, some kind of deference towards small businesses to be compliant with what large actors are actually, you know, out there innovating, that would actually be better going forward with pri privacy legislation. But I agree with Richard. I think the train left the station some time ago. And so we often have to catch up uh, both with our, our state partners as well as our our international partners who are quickly defining the standard of what privacy should look like, which I think places us at somewhat of a disadvantage. But for this presidency coming up, it actually may accelerate their interest in doing something quickly versus waiting and trying to figure it out before somebody else starts it again.
No, that's a very good question. And I want to follow up about AI and bias. But before I do, I kind of want to take, now we're at a little bit of a midpoint in this panel, just a minute to think about the culture of privacy. You know, in Europe, privacy is a fundamental human right. In China, there really is no individual privacy. And in the US, I mean, we think about privacy in these ad hoc terms vis-a-vis -vis the Fourth Amendment. But Richard, we don't really have a culture that's centered around privacy. How do you address that when we're clearly going through issues right now where privacy is a major problem? How do we get people to care? It's interesting that you say uh, that we uh, don't have a culture of privacy. I guess I'm beginning, uh, from my perspective, I think we have uh, a fair degree of a culture of privacy. We have our tech platforms, for example, competing with each other on the basis of who can provide the best privacy. Um, we see lots of advertising around this. We see um, a lot of attention and interest in Congress. So I do think we are, uh, there, the alarms bells have been rung about privacy um, and the pressure uh, on our industry from uh, Europe and GDPR and whatnot is, is quite strong. And so I guess, to buck the question a little bit, I think I'm more concerned about a culture of safety. That is, I think we, in the early days of the internet, were less worried about privacy and less worried about cybersecurity. And both of those things have built over the past two decades. But what we haven't really, I think, built is a culture of safety. That is, uh, that we have in society and in government policy and in, uh, and in the tech industry, uh, the idea that we will have a firm idea that this needs to be important as well. And so um, I'm happy to go into more detail on that if you'd like, but I sort of see this as a component that's missing from uh, what we do uh, uh, in the grand debate about what are, what are the most important things. Yeah, and just, I, I do wanna come back to you about that. And just in terms of the way I framed it that way, the reason I did is because, you know, up until the Cambridge Analytica study, you weren't seeing these tech platforms making it priority. And to Nicole's point, you do have people who are scrolling through hundreds of pages of privacy agreements in America and just clicking accept because that's what we've been trained to do. And so going back to the safety issue, I think that obviously privacy and safety are different things, but safety is something that, again, isn't as paramount in the conversation. My question is, what role do parents play as a part of this? Because in the FOSSI study that just came out a few days ago, parents say they want to be a part of this. They do say that they enforce rules, but it's really hard for them to keep track of what their kids are doing, especially when they're trying to balance work at home and kids maybe off in another room doing their schoolwork. Oh, that's a perfectly fair question. And I was really very interested to see the FOSI report, uh, really a really useful uh, set of information to develop here. I guess I see it as uh, sort of three big categories, each of which has a role. You have parents and kids and how they're protecting themselves. Uh, you have the government actors and you have the providers and the industry groups. And I think all of them have a role here and an important role. Uh, kids and parents, of course, they need to educate themselves and uh, have those family conversations. They need to, to use the tools that are available in order to provide for privacy and safety. Um, but is it really realistic, I think, to expect uh, at this stage parents to be able to control all those things? I think it's not realistic for them to be the whole solution. A government, uh, we can have policies and we should do more, I think, uh, on education and awareness raising. And for those of, those of us in the law enforcement community, we are going to try to respond to protect kids online and to do those things. And indeed, we've tried to work very hard at those kinds of problems. But again, I don't think that's going to be a whole solution to the to the problem of uh, safety online. And then finally, uh, providers and industry. Uh, providers, I think the interesting part of that report was maybe can step up their game on providing better tools for parents and kids to protect themselves. But also, I really think there needs to be a focus in the industry on safety as a priority. So building in safety into the design and the operation of the platforms themselves how do they moderate? Are they doing a good job of, of uh, detecting and blocking child sexual exploitation material or grooming behavior or cyberbullying? How do we get a better response from industry? And so that's an important conversation that I think is beginning. And that's why I say it's probably catching up uh, to where we are on privacy and cybersecurity. Um, but I would point uh, viewers to, um, I think, an important document that was developed by uh, the five or six big tech companies and five countries uh, that was released in March of this year called the Voluntary Principles uh, for Combating Child Exploitation Online. 
it's a really a framework document to think about uh, what com companies can be doing, how they should prioritize this. And I think uh, it really shows leadership on the group that was included there. And we hope that uh, that leadership can be seen to, to go across all sorts of different platforms that, that might uh, be uh, looking for a way to engage on this. I mean, I told, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I was, I, if I could just jump in, I haven't be being the parent of 14 year old, I think everything that Richard said, I echo, but I, I want to speak to all the parents. It's absolutely tough. Um, and here we are as professionals in this space. And honestly, you cannot keep up. I mean, the platforms change and it's not just the platforms changing the technologies that are now used to, um, you know, enable phones. For example, I just got a new phone and my face enables it. And then my daughter will soon get a phone and her face will enable it. And our faces are similar if you know my kids, but they're not the same. And so what does that do in terms of the type of um, contracts that we have between each other on her safety? I, I, uh, Steven always asked me to share these stories and I'm always that person on Fossey panels that has some you know experience but just recently my daughter was um on twitter and i guess she's a stands of a, of a famous popular group of, that she listens to and for some reason i got the email uh, or tweet that my daughter was saying very awful things through this account and we're not even connected nor did i have an, you know our names or our relationships are not connected and it freaked me out uh, to the point where I had to have a conversation with my daughter that this person not only tracked me down, but knew where she went to school. And when she looked up the identity of this person whose photo was another person who was in the entertainment industry, not this, not the individual that was making these types of claims, you know, I reported it, but I immediately had to take away her account and have this conversation. And I think this is the, the multiple conversations that we as parents have to have, particularly when we do not have, as Richard has said, the tools to navigate safely through these um, components. And I love what you said, Sarah, when we're sitting downstairs for eight hours. So for every parent out there, I just move my office next to my daughter's place where she's studying. We have no idea the types of conversations that are going on. And to be authentic to what I like to look at in terms of my research, communities of color, and I think about the increasing numbers of black children, black girls in particular, that are missing from bedrooms, you know, or are tied to these devices in ways that are unhealthy. You know, I'm educated. I work in this space. But what about parents who do not? So I do think, like Richard said, we have to really figure out ways to just be much more responsible, much more um, transparent, and have conversations that cut across our lived experiences so we can all see that we have these common concerns to ensure that we maintain the safety of our children. Going to the safety of children, Alex, I want to pivot something to you, which is cyberbullying. When we talk about child exploitation online, I think all of the platforms has a, have a pretty uh, common sense here that that's something that's obviously legally problematic, but morally problematic. But bullying is different. Every platform has totally different lines as to what they consider bullying. Would we censor someone in comments? Is it just something you say in the videos? Uh, what do you think is the state of cyberbullying right now? And how has it gotten worse or better, but I imagine worse during the pandemic? Yeah, it is really challenging, right? And you have kids at homes on screens, often unsupervised. Um, and there are dark places of humanity that manifest themselves right on screen as they do in the off screen world. I do think there needs to be an important conversation about some trade offs, though, right? We're talking about safety and how important that is. I'm a mother of two young kids. I believe that deeply with my soul. On the other hand, when we think about the mechanisms through which that safety comes, it can come at the expense of particularly teenagers, young adults, free expression, and how they find themselves in community online. So we have to think about the teenager that is trying to go online and maybe find an LGBTQ support group, right? Or somebody that is trying to find counseling online, somebody that is trying to find that emotional connection, and they can't get it in the home. They need to find it outside the home, and the internet is gonna be the place for them to find that community. How do we reconcile these tensions of wanting to avoid traps, the worst of the worst, people that will, that will lead children astray, but at the same time allow those types of communities to flourish where kids can find support, even if their parents might not actually support what they are doing, right? And we know that there are plenty of kids that are navigating those really tough questions as they think about their own identity. So pulling back, this actually comes back to our earlier, the, the point that you began the conversation with, looking at 230 reform content moderation practices. Again, I am a big believer in making sure that companies are being responsible and thoughtful in this space. But when we think about some of the legislation questions that are out there, there can be really negative unintended consequences when companies step in and begin to over moderate because they fear liability, 
And the Sesta Foster Bill that Richard mentioned is actually a really good example of this. That was a noble, noble goal driving that, trying to stop the creation of online sex trafficking or the perpetuation of sex trafficking. But one of the very, it's being recorded, one of the documented side effects is that lawful sex workers, people trying to find community and support online, had their pages taken down too. And what that means is that you actually drive bad conduct even in that instance, even further into the shadows. And because it's an overbroad tool, take away those spaces that people need to find community. So when we think of now moving into the kids conversation, we think about what some of this legislation could look like. If a platform is suddenly unduly worried about facing liability in all 50 states because of any type of conversation that a kid might have been let down, what does that mean for their decisions as to how they are going to make, moderate content? Are they going to start having age verification checks for a kid to be able to engage in any type of social media? How would they police that? And what does that mean for teenagers trying to find other teenagers in kind of regular community? Are they going to start suddenly policing any communication between a teenager and an adult? Are they going to suddenly stop policing LGBTQ youth support groups? We have to think about what these unintended consequences could be, and not just in the abstract, not just First Amendment as an absolute. These are actual communities of kids, and we have to think through the trade-offs in this really complicated conversation. Yeah, and, and if I can, I'm sorry, go but ahead, Nicole, go ahead. Alex said something that I think is important to sort of tag on to as well, which is, you know, having those trade-offs defined in a way that we can actually figure out what parts of this do we really need to regulate, and then maintaining, I think, this um, ability of people, particularly young people, to find themselves on the internet, I think is really important. One of the things though, I would also suggest, though, is we have to tell parents about what this internet is, right, and what it looks like today. I mean, today, the algorithmic economy actually places the white supremacists, the black nationalists, the lifestyle enthusiasts the LGBTQ kid, my daughter, all in the same playground. And sometimes they meet up and sometimes they actually operate in separate spheres, not knowing that they're really influenced in, in very strong ways because of the lack of um, brokers that may break the polarization that actually happens online as it does in person. And so thinking through, what does that look like? I mean, I know probably all of us on this call have stayed up at night trying to figure out what is that policy that enhances and improves upon participatory parent engagement. I still have the Fosse rules of engagement on my refrigerator from years ago. And I use that as a methodology to talk to my kids about, you know, those bad actors that, you know, just years ago was that person that was behind a curtain that you didn't know and you didn't want to meet on the street to now, you know, these groups that have the ability to influence young people towards the type of militancy that we may not want to see because it's white supremacist, supremacist driven. So I think it's things like that that make this even more complicated. Just a matter of years. Uh, and I do uh, really want to pat Steve and, and the Fosse team on the back because they kept us honest as we've had these conversations as parents, as professionals and government leaders trying to understand this. It's interesting, you know, you do see in this conversation, we're talking about things that I think tech platforms five, seven years ago weren't even addressing. You know, it was all about innovation. They weren't talking as much about how they can sort of regulate that innovation to create a safer environment. But one of the consequences, as we've discussed in consequences of that moderation is people are starting to leave these more regulated platforms and go to other more dark corners of the internet. And so, uh, Richard, my question for you is, if you have the big platforms, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the YouTubes of the world, start to get better at moderating conversation, where are bad actors going to go? And are we as a society, are we as a government looking in those corners? What are you finding? So I guess I would answer it in two pieces. Uh, one is, um, as far as the big platforms, if they are doing a more protective uh, uh, content moderation, more protective policies towards children, that's a good thing. And many of our conversations and our children are going to be on those platforms. So there's absolutely, I think, value in uh, pushing forward on policies like that. Um, it is true that uh, bad actors may shift their, uh, their uh, activity elsewhere. That's natural. But I think it's important to be able to differentiate. If you're a parent, you can say, I know that this platform does a good job of safety and I want my kids on it. And these other ones, hopefully we have better tools to block it, or at least we can begin to address those kinds of questions. But as far as bad places on the internet, absolutely. There is a uh, shocking degree of um, 
uh, bad uh, activity, um, criminal activity on the dark net in particular, um, also in other places, but the dark net is a big focus of it. We've really seen a frightening uh, increase in the scope and complexity and dangerousness of this activity. Um, it, it's almost too awful to think about, but there are platforms on the dark net with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of users that are focused on sexual exploitation of infants and toddlers. So it is really an enormous problem. It's a growing problem. It's one that we're trying to address, but it's very hard and it's very hard to do much about it. I think those kinds of problems uh, that we've talked about are unfortunately exasper exasper uh, exacerbated uh, during the pandemic of that kind of grooming and uh, as, as kids are more online, more of the time. Uh, so there's definitely this big problem out there. So to circle back, I'm sorry, just quickly on the, uh, the, the point before, I agree that content moderation is ha, may have unintended consequences and we need to think very hard about it. I agree uh, that this is a hard problem, especially where you have uh, online environments where adults and children are intermingled and we in the real world would have rules and thoughts and norms about like on a playground, if an adult approaches a child on a playground, that's not okay. And it will be looked at and whatnot. But online you have gaming situations where it's very much more nebulous. So all that's to say, I think um, having this conversation, thinking through these issues carefully, having an open debate and dialogue about it, like we're having now. And like, I hope we will continue to have is really critical. It's not, that we have all the answers, but uh, I think we certainly, from my perspective, have a, uh, a piece to share uh, to to uh, understand the situation and to try to come up with something that does strike the right sort of balance. This is a question for everyone, but I'll start with Alex. I'd like to hear everyone's answer on it. You know, right now, COPA, the Child's Online Privacy Protection Act, it's uh, the age is at 13 for you to be uh, having the age of consent. And there have been some conversations about lifting that age to 16 years old. I want to get all of your perspectives on what you think the right age of consent online for children should be. Alex? Yeah, it's a tricky question. Historically, CDT has um, advocated in keeping it where it is. And the reason is uh, we do believe in teenagers engaging in that self-exploration and the number of teenagers that are looking to engage with community, find others online um, as a kind of as they grow up and as they uh, engage on that journey. Um, but, you know, I followed these issues for a long time and certainly do understand the arguments um, and agree it's, you know, it's a tough question to have. Nicole? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to pinpoint what age is actually correct. And I'm beginning to believe like the uh, research that, you know, where children are neurologically, where they are in terms of their, you know, uh, ability to be in a space where they can discern right and wrong, or they have the moral compass to know when the man shouldn't be in the playground with them. I mean, those are kinds of things on the online space. I, I really love what Richard said. You cannot negotiate that when you're in these um, gardens online that, De, uh, you know, do not have the same type of borders or boundaries that we expect in real life. The question becomes, you know, are there particular applications that that outgrow young people too? You know, the whole conversation around, you know, my daughter, when I say I'm on Facebook, she goes, eek, you're on Facebook, I'm on this. And then that kind of creates the type of conversation we're having today, which is I have no idea just how deeply engaged she is with some of those technologies unless I try to learn it myself. So I, I just think that going back to some of the principles, there's some things that policy just just cannot mitigate, right? There are things that policy in and of itself is not going to be the determinant of how you use technology in your household. I'm convinced of that, despite being a person who's very much for the use of technology. I think it is really important to have those conversations and to engage participatory parent models where you determine what that social contract is in your home, when you think that content is appropriate, and I have to say this, parents, you might have to actually get on there and use some of these applications yourself, even though you may not want to. Uh, my daughter just recently came to me with a dancing app that she wanted to um, subscribe to. Of course, I'm so busy on these Zoom calls, and it's not to say I couldn't use them and you, you know, lose a couple of pounds, but I landed up joining it and putting it on my account so she could actually access it so I could see the type of activities that were happening because it does involve linkages with other friends and other dancers across the world. So I think, again, 
there are things that we can say, Sarah, which would be the most appropriate age, but having had two children who are at different stages of life, I feel like I've had this conversation before. And in both cases, it's it's not been completely the right age. So I think going forward, we need an all hands on deck strategy. And I think that this is where this administration has its potential to sort of go back and do what we used to do with policy. And that is bring together multi-stakeholders even people that live in these experiences to the table to have some real life conversations on where policy can meet, where innovation sort of stops in terms of realizing the experiences that people have every day. I think that comment is a good one that parents should be downloading the apps their kids are using and learning about them. Uh, Richard, I'd love your take on this and I'd love for you to expand on the idea that you were saying um, there are certain places in the internet where that age and construct might change like gaming. So uh, I'm afraid I don't know that I've got a, a big answer for you for the Department of Justice writ large. Um, as a parent, certainly looking at uh, my children are grown and out of the house now. But when I look at what's going on with the younger set today, it seems that ever earlier are they getting access to the Internet, to devices, to to on an uh, apps and other things that are that are involving them in the broader internet at an ever younger age. And that's uh, disconcerting for me. I, I do think uh, that thinking about the types of places that we have online, maybe it's, it's hard to form policy around that, but I think it's a consideration that we need to think about. There are certainly places like, say, Roblox, which is a gaming platform intended for children and is almost entirely populated by children. And you can have one set of rules there that makes sense. But when you have a gaming conversation platform like Discord, uh, which is intended to be used by both adults and children as they game and on and on, well, maybe we need to think about what the rules are for that in a slightly different way than we would that we would uh, expect uh, to uh, to address things with a with a platform or a, a context uh, that is entirely aimed at children. So I don't know that I've got a big answer for you, but uh, I think it's an important question to be asking. Alex, a lot of tech platforms. Yeah, I'm going to bring you in. Just wanted to say a lot of tech platforms using AI to try to navigate what these boundaries are. So I'd love to hear your follow up, and also if you could address that. Sure. So the piece I was going to add is that I think some of the pressure would come off this conversation when we pass baseline federal privacy legislation, right? Right now, COPPA is doing an awful lot of work, and then people are falling off a cliff when they come out of the COPPA protection. Um, and so that's another piece of the puzzle is that if we all have better safeguards, um, I think we're, it, it relieves some of that pressure about changing the age gap. Uh, as for the use of AI, um, Yes, an increasing number of platforms are turning to AI for content moderation, particularly in the pandemic. We saw a lot of the major platforms sending their content moderators home, right? It wasn't safe for them to be together doing this, um, which ties to a separate conversation about the working conditions of many content moderators and just how hard that job is. But the idea that that idea of having AI kind of play a role in moderation is going to be increasingly tempting for companies. One of the things that we are calling for is for companies to really study that and to analyze its effectiveness and some of the unintended consequences. We've talked a little bit about how AI tends to average towards the norm, right? Patterns of speech are different. Um, and so we, there's a lot of, there's an entire body of research around how algorithmic systems may exclude the speech of marginalized voices, historically underrepresented groups. And so if we're moving to a world where content moderation is increasingly being automated, I think there is a real risk about that building in biases that have significant consequences for people's free speech. So again, this keeps being the watchword of this conversation, we need to think about the balance, right? There's a world in which those tools can be useful, but we need to really study their effectiveness, think about unintended consequences, and make sure there's a robust public dialogue around what some of those trade-offs might be. Yeah, and, and cool. uh, yep, I was going to bring you in. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I could totally agree with uh, Alex in terms of, you know, the use of AI in its current form as probably the equalizer and ensuring that it encom encompasses all the lived experiences of the groups, particularly when the work, the developers that are actually doing and pro programming many of these things are not inclusive, but that's a whole nother story. But what I would actually say is, I think that there's also the opportunity for a policy to wrap around 
what AI actually emboldens, which is the ability to micro-target in ways that move beyond content moderation, but also find themselves where they go deeper and deeper or take a child deeper and deeper into content that may lead to this dark place. So when you think about us as human beings, we have all been home for the last 10 months. We have been on the computer. We have purchased online. We have watched movies. We've listened to the same music. And as a result, the computer has actually gotten much more, much better in perfecting how they micro target our, our interests, our lifestyle, as well as our needs and wants. And when we think about young people, the same thing is going on. I mean, it's so interesting that schools have actually placed kids in a wall garden for education, but they're still doing research and studying outside of that wall garden. And every time they put in a click or they put in a search, it returns something back to them. We already know with people of color that that returns back often discriminatory searches that have nothing to do with your income. It's based on all the historical precedents that's been set and known about your group. We see it in misinformation as well. And so I think that there might be something valuable. And this is something, for example, with children that I've been advocating on facial recognition technology. There are some areas that should just be off limits. Uh, collecting the faces of kids under the age of 18 for facial recognition might be one of them. Figuring out how we actually look at deceptive um, practices that really kids in by click and bait strategy, something Alex mentioned earlier. I think in addition to a federal privacy standard, we may look at some of the practices that has optimized the marketing potential of some of the platforms and make them off limits in certain cases where there are young people involved. And that doesn't often just involve content moderation. That just involves the opaqueness of the internet and how we actually have this trade-off for why it's free. Um, and I think our kids, unfortunately, have gotten sucked into it so much earlier than we have where you know we've had this revelation I'm, I'm sure everybody through your parent or grandparent that says i cannot believe why i'm being followed by that tent that i looked at on you know on a, a search engine and now it's showing up in my email just imagine for young people how that's actually happening as they're consuming games and celebrities and they're showing these inferential associations between the types of music they like or the types of clothes they like it can lead to a very dark place that does uh, body shaming or bullying or or other things that you know we've been talking about that are not necessarily the best outcome for young people. So I would just throw that out there because I think at the end of the day, we, we try to put this in the boxes of legislation that we designed for kids, not understanding that we as adults don't know how fluid this internet is. And we may want to think about this new internet ecology, particularly one that is now exacerbated after the pandemic, is actually embracing other practices and other activities and behaviors that might be worth taking a look at. Nicole, I just want to follow up with you because I think that's a huge point that you're making. The internet was created by adults for adults, and now it's being penetrated by kids. Um, the question I wanted to follow up with you on AI and bias is what responsibility should we be putting on tech platforms to make sure that they are addressing this? I mean, you still look at some of the, I know there's so much diversity that they're trying to bring into their cohorts, but there's still a lot of major problems with uh, AI and bias. What would you recommend or ask of them to do or how do you, should we hold them accountable? You know, I mean, I think first and foremost, we have, we do, we must, I have to say it that way, represent in the workforces of the developers, people who look like the people that are actually going to use the products and services. So it's particularly important that we actually have these inclusive work systems and ecologies that are driven by your demographics, but I'm a sociologist and I talk about this, driven by you know social scientists, ethicists, privacy specialists that actually sit at the table when we're looking at particularly those AI applications that have implications on one's wealth, their well-being, where they live, and where they might actually be drawn to this darker place based on their gender, et cetera, et cetera, the intersectionality. I think that's one thing. I think also that we have to recognize as consumers that the algorithmic performance is really much in the is very much in the hands of the provider. So so they need to do better because guess what? These brick and mortar stores where people actually had face-to-face -face customer service are going away. And as I see it, do you want to have an algorithm in facial recognition, for example, that doesn't recognize black women's faces or when we change our hair? Because that what that tells me is that your product is not optimized for the diversity of this country. But that putting the onus just on companies to do better based on the fact that they are actually creating in a space where the training data as well as the workforce reflect the society in which we live. The most important thing is finding the right regulatory uh, pressure points. So what does that mean? Civil rights application so that we do not create algorithms that steer people away from fair housing and fair credit. What does that look like in terms of other pressures and 
regulatory sandboxes so that we could actually co-create to ensure in places like financial service, employment and housing and other really sensitive categories, healthcare, we're not replicating the systemic inequalities that exist offline. And then finally, I would say, and this is part of a model I'm actually developing at Brookings, which is like this energy star rating or housekeeping, better housekeeping seal, is that we need civil society impact and input. You know, a lot of times these things get developed in the lab, they get placed in a context that is not the lab, and then they make a lot of mistakes and land up on the front page of newspapers. You know, the most daunting thing that I do not want to see on the front page of the newspaper is some child who was exploited by a platform that not only dug into their bias, but their intersectionality as a person of LGBTQ background, et cetera. And that's something that we can work proactively forward in terms of looking at what can we do together to improve upon these processes. So I, I think Sarah's a complicated issue. It really is another panel because algorithmic bias is really hard to unpack. But I think at the end of the day, what's actually stopping where we could actually go in the exploration of safe and secure and private information, as Alex has said, is really understanding that getting the standard in place for privacy will allow us to dictate new rules over what attributes about ourselves should be protected and not necessarily seen by the internet as a driver towards predatory outcomes. And that to me is really important for young people. I have a daughter, so I know what products she gets based on her attitudes. And I wanna break that log jam. And I think we as policymakers can help combine a, a combination of the three, some good uh, you know, self-regulatory support good places for public policy and law enforcement, and then areas where civil society can help us to reflect the lived experiences of groups that we're targeting. Nicole, that is a perfect segue into what I wanted sort of our final conversation to be, which is what are the things we need to do looking ahead in the future to ensure that we have some sort of movement? Because, you know, as you said, Richard, you had the Communications Decency Act as a part of the Telecom Act in the mid 90s. Okay, then you had SESTA FOSTA, which your team worked tirelessly on. But it seems like it's like every 20 years until we have movement on something. So I want to ask the three of you, what is it going to take? for us to have actual regulatory movement, um, as well as private sector movement in the immediate future? What kind of pressure do we need to apply other than having these great panels that are hosted by FOSI? Richard, I'll start with you. So uh, as a career employee of the Department of Justice, it's difficult for me to, uh, at this point, uh, speak to the next administration. Um, however, uh, I would say, I think that Engagement by, as you say, uh, society, by parent groups, by teachers groups, by victim groups, uh, by uh, advocates of, of uh, children's rights. These are all really important groups, and I wonder if sometimes their voice is not being heard as loudly as it ought to be. Uh, you know, parents have a real power of the purse. If there is a platform uh, that is uh, not living up to the commitments that it's made, or frankly, is not a safe place that's the kind of thing that gets attention and changes behavior. So I do think there is um, a real opportunity here um, to think about uh, and to engage with those kinds of groups to, em to educate them, frankly, about what are the issues and what are the problems. I think a lot of parents go, I, I don't understand. It's all that hard stuff and I don't know what to do. So finding ways to uh, channel that interest, to, to, uh, to get that input and to make it active uh, in in, uh, in practical commercial ways, I think is is uh, certainly one lever that uh, that I would hope to see um, uh, occur as we move forward. Alex, I worked on Capitol Hill for six years, and the type of thing that gets attention is when folks realize that these are kitchen table issues. And I would say that the stakes of the privacy debate right now makes these kitchen table issues. Right, somebody's COVID history can now follow them around. And it's not inferred from somebody getting access to your doctor's records. It's inferred from your search history, from what information you've been entering online. And there is so much now that is revealed about us. And I think consumers are now aware of that. Parents are aware of that. And we need to show that there is a ground, groundswell of energy and momentum for Capitol Hill to do something about this and for regulators to step in. To be honest, companies are asking for this too. They want the certainty. They want to know what the regulatory landscape looks like in how they are managing consumer data. And they want to restore consumer trust in their products. Let's capitalize on that as people that care about consumer rights and say, okay, let's take that energy. Let's find something that folks on Capitol Hill can agree on early in the new year. And let's really push forward for change. 
You know, and I would say that I think we could take a lot of the issues that we spoke about today and we could obviously go back to Capitol Hill um, and with a new Congress and a new administration and put those issues back on the table. I think what we actually need to do is also take what we've done in the last 10 months and be creative. I mean, our teachers have been heroes. Our first responders have been heroes. Our health professionals have been heroes and they have figured out how to do this, you know. Uh, nurses putting on garbage bags and goggles to when in the absence of PPE, teachers figuring out how to get hot spots to kids out of their own pocket. It's for some reason we sort of get caught up in the same issues and it might be time in this next year to really think differently about how we look at children's privacy, how we look at these issues related to the internet and how we actually, again, put all hands on deck policies together to make it work. I do think it's important to center racial equity at the square of all of these things that we do. Um, it is going to be a a challenge based on where the Senate lands up uh, next year. But I think it could be possible that people have shown in this election that they want to do something different and they do want to make sure that people are not left behind. And I would actually offer just a couple of provocations on that as well. I think as we have this conversation, we are ignoring the fact that there are 18 million people that were offline before the pandemic and they're going to be a lot more after as we look at foreclosures and evictions, et cetera. And those folks have kids um, and they have kids that are often not with a parent at the home as I said earlier, because both of their parents are working. And so I think it's important for us to make sure that we have universal service to those families, that perhaps we also think about ways to fund or underwrite these types of programs, much like what Fossey has put on, to educate the populace on these issues that we're talking about. Because I do agree with Richard. I think the days of just talking to ourselves may be over, and there may be a lot more participative politics with groups really coming to the top and claiming this White House as their own, particularly since many of those voting blocks from the urban in areas, rural areas in the suburbs help to actually seal this deal. So I think, again, going forward, it's just really important to sort of unpack these issues and make them real. And the unfortunate thing, Sarah, is the technology is probably advanced in the time of this conversation. Um, so we'll always be one step behind. But I think on the very values and principles of what this social contract is that we've actually developed with any communications technology, it remains the same. And so going forward, we have this opportunity, like my colleagues have said, just to do something different. And I'm hoping that we'll go back into a Capitol Hill where people just did really crazy things with duct tape and, you know, all types of little small concoctions to get through it. Like, you know, setting up Zoom uh, platforms and stages in the corner off corner of your homes that will take that energy and ingenuity and put it into policy making as we go forward. <laughs> I hope so too, Nicole. This has been so informative. Thank you. Before we wrap, I just wanted to do a quick review of some of the things we learned. Alex, I love what you said that we can't have binary discussions. Things on content, labeling, algorithms, they all need to be uh, sort of taken in context together. We need to move forward the, uh, past the politicization of some of these issues, especially Section 230. Richard, what you said about Section 230 being created to help elevate the good Samaritan, but then being weaponized by the mad Samaritan. I think that's an excellent point. It's something that we all need to be thinking about in terms of future regulation. Um, Nicole, we have to be really careful around Section 230. And I know this is something that Alex and CDT feels as well. So we don't limit the diversity of voices on platforms. And so we don't limit the access to tools like support groups, mental health groups online. Um, Nicole, I like what you said about kids are more astute because there are online, but thank you for sharing that stat that there are still dozens of millions who don't have access to broadband and thus they can't engage online. They can't be doing their homework the same way as kids who have that access. So bridging the uh, broadband divide is absolutely critical. Um, Richard, I like what you said and I think it jives well with what Alex's point was on the federal privacy law. CCPA and some of these state patchwork legislations are very confusing. And so it might make more sense that we have a federal law that's going to take after something closer to what Europe does. Um, in terms of what's gonna happen and in terms of laws, we're all hoping that something gets passed in the next few years. But it seems to me like there is some skepticism on this panel that we might get something passed in the next Congress. Who knows? Um, I'm really excited that I got to talk to three parents on this panel. I think you all brought really important insight as to how you actually have to grapple with managing a pandemic school, remote learning, as well as parents working from home, it can be very, very troublesome. And then the last thing I really wanted to highlight here, because this is something to be driven home. Of all of the things we talked about today, Nicole, your point that whatever legislation, regulation, 
or progress needs to be made has to be inclusive and has to be mindful of how we're going to elevate diverse voices, whether it's using AI, using the power of the purse. Uh, thank you so, so much to all of you for joining today. This is one of the most fascinating conferences. Thank you to Fossey for having uh, all four of us today for the final panel. And we hope to stay in touch with you as the year goes on. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Well, and thank you, Sarah, for a terrific summary of that discussion. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking, because I sat in on the youth activist panel earlier this afternoon, and um, so much of what you all have just been discussing, they are going to inherit, and they are the ones who are going to uh, follow through on so much of what you discussed. Um, so anyway, it's certainly going to be an interesting ride, uh, 2021. And, beyond and uh, we look forward to working with each of you and for that matter the incoming Biden administration.